Because I know y'all are rude and like to skip introductions, we have timestamps down below if you want to just jump right into the fantasy video. But I wanted to introduce y'all that haven't seen it yet to the Big Dog Bash, our 1,200 person fantasy football league that's kicking off this summer. You can join it if you want to, but uh, the spots are filling up very, very quick, way quicker than I imagined they would. So there are not a ton of spots left. There are not a lot of words left that I want to say to you. So let's just jump right into thy trailer. My name is Nick Ercolano, and I'm here to introduce y'all to the Big Dog Bash. This is a 1,200-person fantasy football league with a grand prize that's so awesome, it's gonna blow your brains to fucking smithereens. The goal of the Big Dog Bash, super simple. It's become the most engaging, anticipated, and documented high-stakes fantasy football league in the world. The only way to get into the bash with a bash pass, BDG's own very first NFT. In this room right here, in my mom's house, about six years ago, I started this media company, BDGE, or Big Dogs Gotta Eat. And what I did not know at the time was between then and right now, the culmination of all the work we would do as a company would lead us right here to the Big Dog Bash. This is easily the most ambitious project that we have tried to tackle as a company up to date. So what is the recipe for the bash? 1,200 teams, 100 leagues, 12 people in each league. Redraft style, baby. And huge fucking prizes. I mean, we're gonna be giving away ridiculous things monthly, weekly, even daily. Someone's going to the NCAA National Championship game. Someone else is getting sent to the NBA playoffs. And there's gonna be someone leaving the bash with season tickets to their favorite team. That's not even the grand prize. And the coolest part about the bash is all of it's gonna be documented. All we do is make content here at BDGE. Some people might say it's the only thing that we're actually good at doing. And in 2022, almost all the content that we do make is gonna be centered around the bash, content that you might be in. We know your favorite analysts, your favorite creators, and just overall people will be. Hold up. I gotta verify that real quick. Just got done with a run and uh I think I'm ready to bash. Let's do it. I'm in. Bash me! BDGE country. Let's bash. Let's bash it up, boys. I'm totally down. Let's bash. Let's bash, baby. Let's bash. What the fuck is up? I'm in. Let's bash, baby. Oh yeah, you know what I'm ready to bash. Some skulls. Let's bash. Bitches. Let's bash, bitches. So here's the real kicker. If you own the Big Dog Bash NFT, you are getting entry into the Big Dog Bash for three years. You wanna sell that shit after year one and recoup your money? Fantastic. I don't really care. I'd love to have you stay for all three years, but it's your NFT and it is up to you. Now, remember that grand prize I mentioned earlier. The winner of the Big Dog Bash is going home with 10,000 shares of BDGE. You're gonna own a piece of our company with zero strings attached. And now you're probably sitting there like, what is an NFT? How do I buy crypto? Are these leagues full PPR? Are they half PPR? What are the settings? And most importantly, how the fuck do I get into the Big Dog Bash immediately? All you gotta do is head over to bigdogbash.com. Any questions you have related to the Big Dog Bash is covered right here on this website, all of it. Or maybe this idea is trash and we should just throw it all away. Welcome, bike. While you guys were watching that trailer, you know, the shirt's tucked, the traps are flexed, and we are ready to talk about some players today that I will acknowledge the type of league winning upside they have. But for whatever reason, I'm getting whiskey dick when they're on the clock. Let's call it, you know what? We're going to call it whiskey click. I'm getting whiskey click when I'm on the clock and they're sitting there and I know the upside is real, but I just cannot seem to draft these dudes. We're talking about five players that have elite upside that I hate drafting in fantasy football this year. And what we're going to do is make the case for both sides. I'm going to tell you why this player has league winning upside. And then I'm going to tell you why I hate drafting them. And I'll leave the decision up to you. First up on this list is Cam Akers, running back of the Los Angeles Rams. The case is very obvious for Cam Akers. Very, very clear. And that's the the, the basis of a lot of times we as fantasy players just think way too much. The basis of it, he's, he's the starting running back 
in one of the best offenses in the league. They were the number six highest scoring offense in the league last year. And they're probably only going to go up from there, man. They are the Super Bowl champs. This was their first year with Stafford. Like they're going to be a well-oiled machine this year. And they've already shown that they are okay with using this dude a lot, right? And I look back at some numbers and I'm saying, you know, since week 13 of 2020, which is when basically he took over as a starting running back there, the guy has played in 10 games and we're including the playoffs here. And he has seen at least 18 opportunities in eight of the 10 games, including games of 22, 32, 25, 30, and 27 opportunities, you know, targets and carries combined, of course. And that is exactly the guy that they drafted him to be at the time. He also has that crazy side, size, speed combination and athleticism. He has pass catching st- skills. He, he has the size to play on all three downs. There are a lot of ways that Akers could just not be a great running back post Achilles tear and still be great for fantasy, i.e. think like James Conner last year, uh, but probably better and a little bit more efficient and probably more touches as well. James Conner only had like a a little bit over 200 carries last year. So Akers could be the guy that isn't really efficient per touch, isn't really efficient per reception, but because the offense is so good and he's a starting running back, he gets a ton of opportunities and he gets a ton of goal line opportunities more importantly. This is why I hate drafting Cam Akers, however. Breaking fucking news. He tore his Achilles a year ago. We are left at a crossroads between who Akers is going to be and who he actually is right now as a running back. The problem is with all those touches, he just hasn't been good at all. And what happens with running backs or players overall that are not efficient, that are not good, over the long run, the team adjusts. They say, we can't keep giving this dude carries and touches if it turns into three yards and a fucking cloud of dust. If you look back at last year, he was horrible. And I know he was six months off the Achilles tear, and we'll get to that in a second. Last year, like really, really bad. Outside of the one, he had a 40-yard catch, which was a trick, but you guys probably don't even remember this. It was a trick play from OBJ where Akers was wide open down the sideline. That was like his biggest play. That was like the, he was renting a fucking private island when he was running the route down the field, okay? Wide open. Now, I know what you guys are going to say. He came back from the Achilles injury in six months. But that's the thing with these Achilles tears, man. You, you don't always get back to speed. Sometimes the timetable doesn't just manifest itself to get stronger as it goes by more. This is not an ACL tear, right? Or, or these other off heard about injuries that happen to NFL players. Like he may never get back to anything above 80% of Cam Akers. So we can literally only go off the sample size that we've seen with Cam Akers post Achilles. And it is not a good one. So to just flip it, and look at all the bad shit we saw and just say, no, he's going to be better. It's a really bad way to play fantasy. The injury optimism will kill you, and the optimism for Akers has soured in my heart, which is why he is on this list. Next up on this list is Mark Andrews, tight end for the Baltimore Raven. Why he has league-winning upside, another very obvious case. The man just posted 107 catches, 1,361 yards, and nine touchdowns. That was the tight end One, he knocked Travis Kelsey off the throne, which is a near impossible feat over the last half decade. His biggest target competition, Hollywood Brown, who saw 145 targets in 16 games, is gone. He is at the ripe age of 26, entering 27, okay? That is the obvious case to be made for why Mark Andrews is elite and you should be drafting him. Why I hate drafting him is the Ravens. The offensive philosophy of Baltimore has been so run heavy and so slow since Lamar Jackson has taken over, except for last year when all of their running backs got hurt. This is going to be way more reminiscent of the 2018 second half, 2019, 2020 Baltimore Ravens than what we saw last year. I have a very, very hard time taking a tight end in the first or second round, which is where you need to take Mark. He's not a first round pick, but you have to get him in the second round pretty much if you want to own Mark Andrews, okay? And if you look at the Baltimore Ravens pass rate and the pass rate rank, And the pace of their offense prior to last year, pass rate, dead last in both 2019 and 2020, 44.9% of their plays were passes, 45.9% were passes in 2020 and 2019, respectively. The pace of their offense, second to last in 2020, dead last in 2019. Their offense, I can't emphasize this enough, is not going to be what we saw last year. They do not want Lamar Jackson throwing 57% of the time. They want him down in that 45% range. And it hurts everybody on that team, including Rashad Bateman. Of course, with Hollywood Brown gone, it does open up things for Mark Andrews a little bit more. This doesn't make me not want Andrews. It makes me not want him in the second round where you have to draft him. Speaking of the Baltimore Ravens and just staying on the team is J.K. Dobbins, the running back for the Baltimore Ravens. 
Why he has league winning upside? Uh, I mean, he's just an awesome fucking running back. He was so, so, so good. He's one of the most efficient running backs in the league. He's explosive. He's sharp. He's quick. He's all of it, right? He's a lot like Aaron Jones on the goal line, too, where you could look at him and say, oh, he's a little bit undersized, even though Dobbins is not really even that undersized. I think you kind of just think of him as more of like a, you know, an explosive, smaller kind of back, but he's not that small. But he's like Aaron Jones, in which he's so fluid in between the tackles. He has great vision, and that usually equates to goal line scores uh, at a very, 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 very high rate. And that's why he scored eight touchdowns in the final eight games of his rookie year. Man, they started giving him that workload, and he was dominant on the goal line. And for the counter option of why I just, you know, shat on Mark Andrews is why I might like J.K. Dobbins a little bit more because I know this offense is going to be very, very run heavy. I do say, I will say, however, though, like I think the argument of like people are saying, oh, look at Devonta Freeman's catch rate last year. Look how many targets and receptions he got. It's stupid because that was the product of them passing two times as much because they don't want to run it with fucking Devonta Freeman. You can't have your offense in 2022, 2021 run through 30 year old Devonta Freeman. Of course, they're going to pass it more. So I think that's a stupid argument. I do think J.K. Dobbins is a great pass catcher. I just, this offense, that's just not how they run their offense. So I'm not going to just like project fairy tale numbers into what J.K. Dobbins receiving work is going to be. That's the upside for him is scoring 14 rushing touchdowns because he's great down there. And this is a very high run volume offense. Why I hate drafting him. The ACL tear, man. Again, the injury optimism is one of the biggest flaws in fantasy players' games. They just expect players to come back at 100%. We don't like drafting players one year removed from an ACL tear. He's not even on the field yet. And John Harbaugh is coming out and saying that he's a little bit concerned. So if a coach is saying he's concerned about him not being on the field yet, I am wildly concerned. I'm exponentially concerned compared to the coach, all right? He's one year removed from the ACL tear. Uh, Same with Gus Edwards, of course. So it's going to be a very weird backfield to really navigate there. And they also signed a sneaky, sneaky signing that's going to piss us the fuck off for fantasy this year, Mike Davis. He is very, very similar to Buck, to Suck Allen of yesteryear. I remember y'all, I know y'all remember Suck Allen where he was literally two yards and then face plants on the ground, but he was catching 50 passes a year because he could literally just do that. He's not good. He's not efficient. Mike Davis at this point, but he'll play on third downs because he's experienced and he'll start to see 25 to 30% of the running back target share. If he stays on the roster, he's going to be so, so, so annoying. Listen, a lot of just running back upside in fantasy football is built on momentum man. it's like when you're young and you have the clear path to opportunities and touches like you need to seize it and every road bump that comes in the way of it makes it that much more harder to recapture i.e jk dobbins with the acl tear i.e cam Akers with the achilles tear it's like you have such a small window for everything to break right and for you to be that guy that if things go wrong like the percentage dips are very 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 drastic and very you know, very downward angled for them to recapture that shit. So Dobbins, that year was going to be last year for Dobbins. I am. This is why I'm hesitant, right? I know he has a lead upside, but I hate drafting him because I just feel like this is going to be a weird committee where he's not 100% healthy until next year. So Dobbins, not a guy I'm like necessarily targeting. This next one is going to piss a lot of people off. And I want you to hear what I'm saying before you just yell about the actual player itself. This is Jamar Chase, the wide receiver of the Cincinnati Bengals. This is almost exclusively relevant. I think the only argument or the only like conversation to be had for Jamar Chase this year is whether you're taking Jamar Chase or Justin Jefferson, okay? And 11 times out of 10 this year, I'm going to take Justin Jefferson over Jamar Chase. Now, this was a crazy stat that Nate List put up earlier this summer. In 2021, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins had one regular season week where they were both top 20 fantasy producers or better. I love Nate. Nate's one of my guys, but this is actually incorrect. It actually happened two times. I went back and checked the numbers before I spewed it out to you guys. But regardless, dude, two times that they both finished as top 20 wide receivers. We look at both them individually as like really talented players, but for whatever reason, probably because there's so much else going on in the Cincinnati offense, you've got a really strong run game where Joe Mixon's getting 20 to 25 carries per game. You have Tyler Boyd, who's a good pass catcher. Like there's a lot of variables happening where it's tough to predict consistency in this offense. And there's another tweet I thought was like relevant to throw in there. Jamar Chase had 18 percent of his yards and 23 percent of his touchdowns in one game it happens they still count I'm not worried about that like Jamar Chase is the type of player who can go off for 200 yards so obviously that's going to be tight uh, part of his production right but you look at what Jacob uh, Rick Road you know followed up with the last eight games of 2021 he puts Chase's numbers he puts Higgins numbers and Higgins numbers were pretty fucking sky high there Uh, obviously touchdowns were a little bit lower but all the other stuff is um, equally there so it's not a knock on chase as a player at all it's just this offense again is just so jam-packed with talent and there's target competition for just overall touches 
for targets. Uh, and then when you look at like Justin Jefferson, though, in the receiving game, there's not a ton going on there in Minnesota, man. Like we have Adam Thielen, but he's definitely way over the AJ Pex. We have Dalvin Cook and he'll get his receptions. But outside him, we have a lot of unproven guys and Irv Smith and KJ Osborne that you can get excited about. But realistically, Justin Jefferson's target competition is so, so minimal compared to T Higgins. And I like the new offensive situation there in Minnesota where they're going to be a lot more pass heavy, which is how they should be running this offense through Justin Jefferson. Um, so this is not, you know, I don't want Jamar Chase if he drops to the fucking 201, of course, or 204, whatever. This is like if I'm at the 107, I'm taking wide receiver and I'm picking between Jeff Jefferson and Jamar Chase. It is Jefferson 10 out of 10 times. Last guy up on this list, we have Elijah Mitchell, running back of the 49ers. I mean, why he has league winning upside? Very, very obvious. He came in as a six round rookie and dominated, man. He played in 11 games, went for exactly 1100 yards. So if you pace that out. Really, really easy math to do. 16 games would give you 1,600 yards since the 17-game season. He'd have 1,700 yards. That is 1,700 yards from scrimmage. That is so impressive as a rookie, right? And it's not shocking given how athletic this kid is, how much production he put up in college. So all the math adds up. All the math adds up. You are the starting running back in the San Francisco 49ers offense, which always produces top-tier fantasy stuff. We are not projecting you to be good because we've already seen you be good on an NFL field. If he holds the job for the entire year, this guy's going to be a top-10 fantasy running back. He could be a league-winning running back, scoring you know, 12, 14 touchdowns, whatever. The reason I hate drafting him, same fucking reason. He's a 49ers running back. Trey Lance is going to be their quarterback. He is going to get so much rushing volume. Last year, You know, I've spewed this stat off for you guys. Over the three games, if you expand the two and a half to three games and pace it out, over 12 carries per game this guy was taking. He's going to take a lot of carries on the goal line. And we don't know who the goal line back is, right? It might be Elijah Mitchell, but Trey Lance is going to take a ton of them, just like Jalen Hurts did last year for Miles Sanders. Uh, Elijah Mitchell's touchdown upside might be capped at like five or six for the year. You're not you're not a league-winning player if you're, if you're scoring five or six touchdowns. So it might be Trey Lance. It might be a little bit of Elijah Mitchell. They brought back Jeff Wilson. I mean, they got Trey Sermon. They... Uh, drafted Tyrion Davis Price, who's like a bruiser. Like they got a lot of options there, and I'm not confident that uh, Elijah Mitchell is going to be the goal line back there whatsoever. That's also with Trey Lance under center going to lead to fewer receptions at the running back position all around because mobile quarterbacks tend to dump it off less. And he only he only averaged 1.7 targets per game last year to start with. Okay, so now you're talking about a guy like Jimmy G who checks down all the time, and Mitchell was only getting 1.7 targets per game. You add in rushing volume taken away. You add in less dump offs from a mobile quarterback. You just add in the fact that he's not a big pass catcher anyways. I just don't like that they signed or they drafted Ty, Ty Davis Price in the third round. He's likely going to be the short yardage guy in a lot of situations. Murky situation, a lot of upside, but I hate drafting him because there are just so many red flags when it comes to this backfield and Elijah Mitchell as a player. That's what I got for y'all today. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Tomorrow we'll be doing a mock draft. If you want to be in the mock draft, join the discord. That will be linked down below. If you want more information about the big dog bash, all the links will be down below. www.bigdogbash.com has our FAQ. It's got the league rules. It tells you how to sign up. It tells you the cost of everything. It's all there on that website, bigdogbash.com, but all the links for everything are down below. I love you and I will see you tomorrow.